You're listening to Digital Creator with Dylan Schmidt. That's me. I'm excited to bring you some valuable, hopefully valuable pieces of educational segments today. Real quick, let's go over what I'll be talking about in this episode. Uh, First up, I'm going to be sharing the great debate, the greatest debate, maybe even the biggest beef going on right now. No, not talking Kendrick and Drake. I'm talking newsletters. (laughs) Beehive versus ConvertKit arguably the two main kind of email newsletter options for creators. I want to be discussing pros and cons. I've been using both over the past 12 months, and I have some good thoughts to share that I think might help you if you're trying to make a decision on which one is best for you. And then I'll be sharing my findings from recently diving more into LinkedIn. I'll be sharing my strategy and also uh, what I see working moving forward, what I don't see working moving forward. And then I'll be sharing a topic that I talked about on social media that I had a few people asking for more. So I want to go deeper on the idea of psychological segmentation. And I'll share more about that in the third segment. So first up, diving into these newsletter tools. We're going to be specifically talking about Beehive versus ConvertKit. Now there are way more options than just these two, but these are the two big ones right now. There's also Klaviyo, MailChimp, all of those, they might, you know, offer different functionality. There seems to be, from what I can tell uh, in speaking with people, it's like you're either team ConvertKit or you're team Beehive. And I have been team both, which I would say probably puts me in a unique position. And uh, I'll share real quick with you what I've found to be the pros and cons of both. And hopefully you can make a better decision on which one might be better for you. When it comes to pricing, Beehive and ConvertKit, they both have free options. Uh, But if you already have some subscribers, let's say you have a couple thousand, you're looking around like 40 to 60 bucks on each of these platforms. The more subscribers you have, the more expensive it gets to send out emails. Now, looking at the pros of both, for Beehive, uh, what I've found after using it to send uh, out thousands and thousands of emails on both, Beehive, the pros are you have Beehive ads, which offer ad opportunities to grow your newsletter. How that works is you can pay, say you want to spend $200 on Beehive ads, then Beehive makes available the opportunity for other newsletters to get paid to advertise your newsletter. They only get paid when people sign up for your newsletter, which is kind of cool. It incentivizes uh, the same niche of newsletters to kind of stick together. And it could be a really effective way for you to grow your newsletter. Also, Beehive has Beehive Boosts, which allow you to earn referral fees when your subscriber signs up for other newsletters. And I have not messed around with Beehive Boost. I have messed around with Beehive Ads. I didn't find that it was uh, particularly helpful for me because with Beehive Ads, I found the newsletters that were featuring me, they weren't the type of newsletters that I wanted to be really associated with. Now, my experience with using Beehive's built-in kind of way of growing your newsletter, I didn't find it too particularly useful. You know, I've read great accounts of people having a lot of uh, good things happen out of it, but I didn't find it to be that I would get a better quality subscriber. And I think there's an intentionality behind someone wanting to subscribe to your newsletter in the first place. And I just found that I was just better off focusing on growth outside of Beehive's built in platforms. Not to say that it's not worth it, it could be very well worth it for you, could have a lot of success. I just found for me and what my goals were, it didn't line up. Another thing that I loved about Beehive was the email builder. And that's initially what drew me over to Beehive is I am really big on design. And I just found limitations within ConvertKit. So I've used HubSpot. I've used uh, Keep, which was Infusionsoft. I've used Klaviyo. I've used MailChimp. I've used a lot of these different ones. And the email builder is something that's hard to get right. And I think Beehive has the best has done the best job at this out of them all. It's just simple and intuitive and if you have something in your mind, it's easy to get that design translated using Beehive's email builder. Now there are cons of Beehive which I'll cover after I cover some of the convert kit pros. I switched actually just a couple months ago from Beehive back to convert kit and here's some pros that I believe convert kit has uh, over Beehive. Number one, it's far more robust for more than just simply email newsletters. 
Beehive is built for email newsletters. It's not built for uh, segmenting your audience to the scale that ConvertKit is. You can still segment your audience in Beehive. It's just, it's like it's not built for that. And so if you're going to be doing more email marketing campaigns, I found ConvertKit to be the clear winner there because ConvertKit has sequences, which just makes it really simple to essentially create like segmented emails that go out automatically, or you could think of it as like different tracks. So if you create like a lead generator, you put that out there and then someone just goes in through a sequence of emails. That's so much easier in ConvertKit. I don't know that you can currently do that today in Beehive, but ConvertKit makes that really simple. And ConvertKit, this is a pro in my mind, is like the cost. HubSpot, if you haven't checked, is far expensive. If you just have just a couple or a few thousand email subscribers, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, I think the lowest is like $500 a month, unless you have the free version, which is okay. But once you start getting into more uh, features that you're going to want, it starts getting expensive really fast. And so ConvertKit, I think for the pricing and the features is pretty good. Now, one thing that ConvertKit also does really well is the customer support. So I've had to reach out a couple times on both platforms, uh, just having some type of a technical issue. And I found Beehive was severely lacking in this, where it would take days to hear back from their customer support on a simple question. So it was basically, sometimes it felt like non-existent. I think if you have like an enterprise account or maybe one of the highest levels you can uh, get with them, then you get speedy uh, support responses. But with ConvertKit, they are super friendly. You can have a live chat right there, which they didn't have with Beehive when I was on it. And it just felt nice to get your questions answered uh, when you had a problem. Now, which one would be best for you kind of depends on your goals. If you are just running a newsletter and you have no plan really of expanding for other email marketing campaigns, Beehive is amazing at newsletters. They just received, I think it was like 30 or $33 million in funding. And so they are just doubling down on the newsletter game. I believe that they'll, I'm sure they'll roll out more features similar to ConvertKit because uh, just sticking with newsletters, you know, I would imagine that they want to diversify and also tap into the more email marketing side of things, which I hope they do. And I might consider switching back if that was the case. But I found Beehive to be so focused and good for newsletters that my use cases were just wider than newsletters. And so for me, it didn't make any sense to stick with Beehive and not go back to ConvertKit. A con of ConvertKit is the email design is not really intuitive. I think it lacks a bit, especially when comparing it to Beehive. I would just get frustrated at digging through the navigation to find the different designs tweaked to get it to how I want it to look. For example, I recently updated the design of my email newsletter, and it took me somewhere around eight hours just to make the most simple, clean, exactly how I wanted design. And that just wouldn't have taken that long in Beehive. I'm sure that would have taken an hour or less. But if you aren't super big on design, then maybe ConvertKit is just totally fine for you. Also, I should say real quick too, I missed one of the pros for ConvertKit is you can sell stuff through ConvertKit. So they also have landing pages. They both have landing pages, but ConvertKit is more for like digital products. You could sell digital products on there. You could sell different things on there. You can't quite do on Beehive, at least yet. So if you're a more, I would say, well-rounded creator and you're not just doing the newsletter, go with ConvertKit. If you just want a newsletter, you don't care about anything else, even if you want to do a free newsletter, a paid newsletter, whatever, you're just doing newsletters, Beehive is the way to go. Next up, I want to share my LinkedIn strategy. Now, I've had an issue with LinkedIn for a few years now, actually. I've always just kind of like repurposed, or I should say cross-posted content from my other social media accounts to LinkedIn. And just recently, I was like, you know what? I want to play more in LinkedIn. I hear a lot about the reach is great over there. And uh, my friend Lloyd George, who has been on this podcast, and uh, you might be familiar with him, he's had success on LinkedIn. And I just wanted to kind of play with it and see. So I've been posting more and more on there and trying to figure out what is it that I can like over there? Because to be honest, it is weird over there. LinkedIn, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar. I'm not saying anything new here. LinkedIn is weird. 
Like there's a lot of AI comments now. I know that there's some type of automation people are setting up where, you know, they're not just using like chat GBT to come up with the reply. They're automating that. So it just goes through and automatically comments on people's stuff. And what kind of irks me also about that is LinkedIn doesn't seem to want that to be decreased. For the longest time I had where it would say start a post, there would be like some type of button that said like write with AI. So they're encouraging people to just interact. I read some stat, I think I shared it on this podcast or in my social media, or maybe it was just on LinkedIn, that it's something like people spend like such a little amount of time on LinkedIn per day. And I believe LinkedIn is just hurting a bit for engagement. They just want people to engage. And I think that comes at the cost of the quality of engagement, which is pretty low quality right now. Now, I think there's a huge opportunity there because when a platform like LinkedIn is hurting for engagement, that's a great opportunity for creators, right? Because you're kind of filling that hole that exists, especially if you're posting authentic content that people actually enjoy. So brings me to my strategy that I'll share with you. You might've already seen this already because I did share this on my social, but I'm going deeper here. So basically what I'm going to be doing is posting uh, Monday through Sunday, taking a day off here and there. I'll be scheduling the post ahead of time. I'm posting a mix of short, medium, and long posts, and I'm going to diversify the types of posts that they are. So I'll do short text posts, medium text posts, and long text posts. I'll do short, really quick videos and a little bit longer videos. And I'm also going to change up and test different lengths of captions. We'll do very short captions, medium captions, and long captions. And then I'll test hashtags or no hashtags. And now another thing I'm going to be doing is keeping all the topics relational to how I help businesses. So I'll be talking on all the same topics I talk about on this podcast, but I'll be making it a little bit more contextual to LinkedIn. So when I'm scheduling the content, even if I'm cross-posting from somewhere else, I'll make sure to put in the words LinkedIn in the first sentence or two so that when someone's skimming through their feed and they see a post from me and then they see that I mentioned LinkedIn, it doesn't feel like it's just been cross-posted from somewhere else. It feels more personal and again, contextual to the platform that they're on. Helps keep things relevant. Now, I don't think all of my posts fit from what I could tell so far uh, is posting them on LinkedIn. So I've had to create some posts just specifically for LinkedIn, which is kind of fun in its own sense because it's helping me kind of branch out of topics that I would maybe not kind of cover. Also, when I just do text only posts instead of also doing video, it's helping me get ideas out faster. Like I wrote a bunch of uh, LinkedIn text posts one day, like, like six or seven, and I could just queue them up ready to go. No video editing required. It's a different part of my brain that I like. I really enjoy writing. So I think if you are a writer and you don't want to do video where you're showing your face, LinkedIn is a fantastic place to be. I think also if you're in that kind of category of just writing, threads and X and Facebook are also great places to be as well because those are text heavy uh, and can be, right? Instagram, very visual. TikTok, very visual. YouTube, very visual. But there's still plenty of opportunities for text-based social media posts, and LinkedIn is one of those. Last thing I'll mention about my strategy is when it's relevant, I'm going to be adding in the first comment a call to action, whether that's my newsletter, content clips, my video editing company, the Creator Club, my online community for creators, something where they can take a next step and go deeper with me. I won't be adding this call to action in every first comment. But I use Metricool to schedule my social media posts. And what's cool about in Metricool is there's a button when I'm scheduling it that allows me to add in a first comment thing. So I just hit a button. It opens up a little uh, comment window or you know text window. I type in what I want it. And then when it posts on behalf of me to LinkedIn, it automatically will post the first comment. And in the first comment is where I put the link. Now, I don't know exactly you know if they penalize me putting a comment with a link in the first one. Also, you know, kind of paying attention to, is it better to post natively on the platform or am I getting pinged with reach if I post through Metricool? So far, I have not noticed any drawback of doing this, but it's something I am just kind of being aware of as I execute this strategy. 
Last thing I want to cover today is this idea of psychological segmentation. What is psychological segmentation? I haven't heard anybody else talk about this. Not saying that they haven't, and it's just kind of a label. Now, I think it's kind of a blue ocean, if you will. <laughs> so it's the idea, I should, I should say the label to me is new, but the idea of it is not like something I invented by any means. It's something that people do. They're just maybe not aware that they're doing it. And hopefully this label of psychological segmentation gives you a framework on how to contextualize this tool to increase retention in your own podcast or your own YouTube videos or even your own uh, any type of content, really, just so how you can segment it for your viewer. Psychological segmentation is using techniques like pattern interrupts, changing your tone, introducing a new segment, anything you do that keeps the viewer from tuning out during sometimes maybe more predictable parts of your show. It's not always interrupting in the middle of saying something. Uh, just if I was to like start round of applause, right? Like that's not what I'm trying to, you know, I'm not trying to break your pattern. It's just keeping the interest high. There's a podcast that I really enjoy listening to called 20,000 Hertz. If you haven't listened, you should check it out. The producer of 20,000 Hertz was just recently at Podcast Movement Evolutions here in Los Angeles. I wasn't able to attend his talk, scheduling mix up, but friends that went there relayed to me how he shared during his talk that every 30 seconds, there's a new noise or there's a new change in the show. And each show is, you know, 20, 30 minutes long. So that's a lot of changes if you think about it. And you don't have to copy in any one way of doing it. Like you could include as many changes in your own content as you want, but being aware of that, like in this podcast, for example, there's the intro and then there's three segments. And that is a form of psychological segmentation because we're in a different room now, right? This third segment, or I guess you could call it fourth segment really, because there's the intro and then the three segments. But this, let's say fourth segment that we're on right here is different. Like, you know, we're in a different spot than where we were in the last one or the two before that. And that's intentional because I don't want it just to be some run on sentence. But how can you use psychological segmentation in your own content? And sometimes I would say that sometimes people use psychological segmentation when they shouldn't, especially for short form content. They'll try to cram too much into like 30 or 40 seconds when really that 30 seconds just needs to be its own segment. And that happens all the time I see with people making podcast clips specifically is they try to make like three ideas into one and really should just be one. So the ultimate goal of psychological segmentation isn't so that you can cram more into less. It's so that you keep the person interested in what you're talking about and you help them connect deeper with what you're trying to say so that your point comes across stronger. And real quick, before we totally wrap up here, I wanted to make one of two invitations for you. Now, first invitation is if you are not in the Creator Club. If you listen to this podcast, there is a 100% possibility that you are a good fit for <laughs> the Creator Club. And I'm not just guessing that, right? Like, I mean, a lot of people that are like, oh, I kind of like, maybe we'll get around to checking it out or, you know, I don't know. You never really know uh, if something is a good fit until you try it out, right? And that's why I've designed the Creator Club to be as frictionless as possible for you to try out. If you try it and you don't like it, it's not for you. Absolutely no problem. Super easy to cancel and it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, but the reality is creators need support and a community to grow. And it's hard to find a community that you can trust. And so I'm trying to do my best to make the Creator Club a community that is the community you can trust and go to when you need support and you want to grow and you're taking it seriously and you want to focus on things like monetization, things like that. So my invitation for you is to come check us out at thecreatorclub.com or I'll drop a link in the episode description here. Second, if you have listened to this podcast more than three times and you are already a member of the Creator Club, can you do me a favor? a huge favor I'm asking from me to you to rate and review this show. It means the world to me. It's going to take you 30 seconds, but it'll make a big difference on my end. 
I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you for doing that. I'll talk to you in the next one.